Good afternoon everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this next video in mine and Mr Messenger's series of videos on the power and conflict poems that you're studying as part of your English Literature GCSE. This video will focus on Imtiaz Darker's poem Tissue. Um, and normally with these poems we'd start off with a contextual framework. But this is a poem that defies those sorts of frameworks. Yes, you can read this poem as perhaps a response to extreme fundamentalism that we've seen develop across the 20th and 21st centuries. But equally, it's a poem as much about the human condition. And the themes and the ideas that this poem explores, considers and debates and discusses are present throughout the literature of many centuries and many decades and over time. And in this sense, its context is wide ranging and it's more helpful to consider what Darker is perhaps offering as comment. Certainly, we need to see this poem within the structure of the power and conflict collection that we're reading. So we can narrow it down a little bit to what this poem has to say about power over time and what this poem has to say about conflict over time. And perhaps ultimately, the biggest idea that Darker is commenting on is what it is to be human the quality of the human condition, how we live our lives as communities and as societies. But equally, this poem is certainly ambiguous in the meanings it produces and unstable in the meanings it produces. And it's why it feels different to the other poems in the collection, because it's not responding to a specific time or place or particular event in time or history. It is. It seems to step back from history. It seems to gather together all sorts of events into a very small set of images um, and in this sense this is what produces the ambiguity and unstable meanings of the poem. However, a few days before the English literature exam last year Darka did post a tweet um, because she'd been sent loads and loads of questions about the poem and she said in that tweet, I'll just read it to you, uh, the poem follows three sets of images, one fragile tissue human skin set against two rigid structures, social, religious and national, that can cause conflict, and three, light that breaks through. The poem explores how we might avoid conflict by valuing things that tell the real story of our lives. So from this, we are being given the structure of the poem, three images, three extended metaphors that run right the way through the poem. And Darker is very much interested, according to what she is saying, uh, about how our personal histories interact with the national picture that we exist in. So in that sense, certainly the conditions that we live in, the human conditions that humanity uh, survives in, thrives in, or not as the case may be, are certainly all under consideration. Um, but equally, we can consider beyond just three extended metaphors that run throughout the poem. And instead, we can think about this poem as metonymy which is a feature that is in the same family as metaphor and personification and other language devices like that. But unlike those, metonymy is about the replacement of one object with another entirely to give it the equivalence. So, for example, you might refer to a businessman as a suit or your car as your wheels. And here, the tissue could refer to a range of different ideas, issues and objects, which we'll explore when we look at the poem in more detail. And if we take that approach, the poem opens up in terms of meaning and gives us a huge range of potential commentaries and ideas that it comments on. And with that, you know, it would be worth also thinking about some of the poems that you could compare this to. Certainly the place of man within the world means that you could go to Wordsworth's extract from the prelude. Equally, uh, the question of power and human power and human power structures would naturally take you to a comparison to Ozymandias. Um, by the same token, the question of the human condition Blake explores in London. Um, but by taking those sorts of approaches, perhaps a more unusual connection could be made equally to Owen's exposure, uh, because that is as much a poem about the soldiers existing in a state of perpetual conflict in the ways in which they interact with the world around them. But ultimately, as we look at this ambiguous and unstable meaning, um, I want to introduce to you another poet, Don Patterson, who writes about poetry and about how poetry works. And for him, he says that poems work through poets opening doors and letting us explore inside the rooms the poet, the poet creates, which is a little bit ambiguous in itself. But ultimately, he says that poetry is a interaction between the poet and the reader. 
and it's for us to come to meanings. It's for us to arrive at meanings. And that's why I want you to think about this as, yes, extended metaphor, with those three extended metaphors that Darker talks about, the tissue, the structures that those tissues come up against, and the light. But also, I want you to think about this poem through the lens of metonymy, where each object and item in the poem is a replacement for something else. A replacement that leads us to a wider range of potential unstable and ambiguous meanings that we can go on to explore. Okay, let's start with a reading of the poem. Tissue. Paper that lets the light shine through, this is what could alter things. Paper thinned by age or touching, the kind you find in well-used books, the back of the Quran where a hand has written in the names and histories, who was born to whom, the height and weight, who died where and how, on which sepia date, pages smoothed and stroked and turned, transparent with attention. If buildings were paper, I might feel their drift, see how easily they fall away on a sigh, a shift in the direction of the wind. Maps too, the sun shines through their boundaries, the marks that rivers make, Roads, rail tracks, mountain folds, fine slips from grocery shops that say how much was sold and what was paid by credit card might fly our lives like paper kites. An architect could use all this, place layer over layer, luminous script over numbers over line, and never wish to build again with brick or block, but let the daylight break through capitals and monoliths, through the shapes that pride can make. Find a way to trace the grand design with living tissue, Raise a structure never meant to last, of paper smoothed and stroked and thin to be transparent, turned into your skin. Okay, so let's start, as I've just outlined, with the central metonym of the poem, tissue. And again, when we're thinking about metonym, it's when one image replaces another. And it lives in that same family as metaphor. Now, it's all very well and good saying that, but actually what we need to start thinking about is what that could represent, because immediately the word tissue turns into paper in the first line of the poem. If we're taking a conventional approach to this, we probably get two meanings, that the tissue and the paper being referenced can stand for human skin, Equally, and more straightforwardly, that it's tissue paper, or the paper of a book. And we certainly get books and maps referenced later in the poem. But that's not really metonymy, that's not really a metonym, that's a metaphor, when one thing transforms into another. Because what we're talking about here is an act of replacement. And actually what we could more interestingly argue is that this tissue that Dark is referring to, the paper, actually is standing for all of human civilization. And if we do that, actually this unlocks a wider range of issues and ideas, because this means that Darker comments on human history. It means that she highlights the struggles of human history and some of the problems of humanity. But she doesn't just leave these as problems. She does go on to pose and offer us some solutions. So that is one of those, one, the, the central key opening metonym that actually this tissue paper is a metonym for all of human civilization and all of human history. And why can we say that? Because we record our history on paper. So we can start working our way through the poem, and I'll keep this in pink so we can see it. This is a paper that is thinned by age or touching. So right there, the more we touch the paper, the more it ages and thins and weakens, perhaps in the same way as our connection to human history breaks down, the further we get from it. But equally as we move into the next line, 
we go back to the back pages of a holy book, the Quran, and we see that the user, the owner of that Quran, has written in their names and histories. So a personal history can be recorded. And that seems to legitimise the individual's place in human history. And that within this metonym, it is as significant as a holy book. And then as we move through, we have this idea of the pages thinning and turning transparent, return again. So we have this metonym developing. It's as though age causes transformation. It potentially causes weakness, but I'm going to put a question mark next to that because darker doesn't make that seem like a negative. But I'm going to come back to that in a moment and I'll show you why that's the case in a moment. Because we're going to keep tracing this through. Because on pages of books, you have lines, line dra lines drawing things. And so this keeps developing. We go from holy books to maps. We have those marked there. Those maps have border lines, and we mark, just like in Blake's London, the marks of weakness, the marks of woe, the marks of the chartered Thames. We have rivers and roads and rail tracks and mountain faults. So within our maps, we attempt to define nature and the natural world. We are trying to codify the natural and perhaps in this poem, the miraculous. And this makes this poem an excellent comparison with the prelude, particularly at this moment of the poem. So that's, again, human history. This is what we do as humans. We want to, and humanity wants to codify, control, and categorise. And what's interesting about history is that history and classification is always done by the powerful. And we have that sensibility then carry on because we're introduced to the figure of an architect who takes layer over layer. So we have someone who organises the paper into a construction. Um, and those constructions are defined and controlled and designed. And that is in opposition to the beauty of nature. And we'll come back to this idea in a minute because we have the paper and the light in this poem as two different metonyms that run all the way through it. Um, but we have instead of this being a negative construction, a constraining, controlling construction, we have instead a city where daylight can break through capitals and monoliths. So this light, and we'll look at this again more closely in a moment, the light is allowed through in this architect's design. Um, and we come to this idea here that we this is a living tissue. And we have here a locus, a centre, you'll know that word from maths, for humanity and the potential for humanity. Um, and we have this idea of paper being smoothed and stroked. 
of it being gently shaped before we come to the final line of this poem, separate and fragmented off. I'm just making sure we clear these all connect together because all of these papers, all of these pieces of paper condense into the single person. So all of the pieces of paper form the individual. If we go back and we're thinking about that central metonym that we, as individuals, and as part of society, inherit the history of human civilization in a negative sense we inherit its flaws and problems but i think the end of this poem is more hopeful because we inherit the solutions to conflict and disparities or gaps in power. So that is one central image traced through. And instead of just dealing with it as an extended metaphor, we're dealing with tissue as a metonym for the entirety of human civilization. This idea that we inherit it, that we embody the entirety of human civilization. But there is a second metaphor that runs all the way through of light. And they contain both in the same line. We have the light that shines through. We can start running this now through the poem. So the light that shines through, this is what could alter things. As we keep moving through the poem, um, we can see here later the sun shines through. So running from the first line through down to here. Um, and as we keep moving on, we have this luminous script over numbers over line. So even the writing itself is gleaming and showing and, and being full of light that's on the page. We have this idea of daylight coming through here as we have this architectural image in the final stages of this poem. Um, and then it is all combined and condenses down into the skin again at the end of the poem. So let's just have a quick look at this and what happens. Because whilst the tissue, the paper, is a metonym for the entirety of human civilization and the way we inherit that, there is the way that light alters it. So we can see that light could be the equivalent of life, that light repairs, light causes growth and change. You know, we only have to think about the way light causes photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is what causes plants to grow. Plants growing provide food and nourishment for us. So in that sense, light allows for growth, allows for change, allows for repair, allows for development. And our skin, according to this poem, permits growth and change to enter in. That we as humans have the potential to grow and change and develop. And even more so, this potential image of age and wearing out of things thinning and things becoming transparent perhaps instead suggests that over time we can or could become more open and permissive to ideas and positive beliefs particularly if we take that positive connotation of life being something that can grow us and develop us. Now, this keeps going. We have the somewhat negative connotation of the maps 
here in this stanza because maps in this poem limit and maps as a metaphor equal the limitation that we impose on ourselves as humans and again a natural comparison might be to Blake's London and the mind forged manacles that we see there um, but here we have maps being a limitation but a repair to that a fix to that is that the sun shines through their borderlines here so actually that this light evades and passes through the limitations imposed by humans. We can probably take that another step further, that the natural world, despite humanity's efforts, apologies, can't be stopped or prevented from developing. And then again, as we move through the architect's design, instead of trying to block light out, is actually instead of the maps and their attempts to put barriers, allowing daylight to break through. So it perhaps is this positive, hopeful development for the future. So, oh dear. So darker offers the sense that humanity could allow a hopeful inspiration to define us. Instead of the codification and the limitations we impose on ourselves. So we have these really extended connections across the poem and it's really difficult to consider each individual quotation in this poem. You've got to track and trace this through. But there's a further consideration that we could make here because we do start with holy books at the earliest stages of the poem. And instead, at the start of the poem, what we actually have in the second stanza is the reference to the Quran. And at that early stage of the poem, we can also be considering the way in which this light recorded on paper is a source of inspiration. And actually, Darker could be asking us to consider the importance and the value of faith. Um, and faith being central to a fulfilled and happy and satisfied life of faith being a means by which human civilization can be improved and restored and redeemed and indeed can even grow and develop in the presence of natural light. And I think there is an oblique, which means indirect comment. On the way, very dogmatic and prescriptive faiths prevent accessing the true beauty and potential of humanity and the world as a whole. And that extreme prescription dogmatic faith faith where you have no choice but to follow the instructions of what you're told to by religious teaching is equally echoed in the more mundane image of the slips the receipts from grocery shops as we go to this latter this middle this middle and final part of the poem because actually here 
we go and we see the way in which these fine slips from grocery shops that say how much was sold and what was paid by credit card might fly our lives like paper kites. That it's these grocery slips, the cost of everything that defines us. So like the religious texts that could be too prescriptive and prevent us from being inspired by this natural and divine and beautiful light, here we have the immediate demands of the modern world in control because we are being flown like paper kites in this simile. So this simile warns us not to be controlled by the immediate demands of modern society. So as we zoom out from this poem, the thing I really want you to pay attention to is not the volume of notes because we've gone through those step by step, but the way in which every single part of this poem is connected to another part of the poem. The central metonym of the tissue connects to the other metaphors and similes and images of this poem. And it's really important that when you are discussing this poem, you trace and track these ideas through. And it's probably more important in this poem than in any other of the collection, because it's only by tracing and tracking these ideas through and across the poem that you can really start to tease out the range of different potential ideas that are accessible within this. Um, and we're just going to move on to next, looking at some of the structural devices of the poem, particularly the lineation and some of the stanza organisation that really help to ensure this smooth and continual flow of ideas, interpretation and representation across tissue. What you should be noticing is just the amount of enjambment that runs through this poem. We have meaning flow from one line to the next, to the next, to the next. And as I've mentioned in earlier videos, when you have enjambment, where you have lineation of any kind, it's better to hone in on a few well-chosen examples. I'm just going to do that here to this stanza. If buildings were made of paper, I might feel their drift. See how easily they fall away on a side, a shift in the direction of the wind. So in this example, we have our enjambment. There's no pause at the end of each line. Enjambment always helps the meaning flow from one line to the next. And here, because we already know about the paper, we already know what the paper stands for from earlier in the video, we also can see the way in which how easy it is for human activity and history to drift, change and be reshaped. And because of the enjambment in particular, that that process is continual and perpetual, that it keeps on happening. So there's one example where we could look at that. But we don't just have enjambment within a stanza, we have enjambment across stanzas as well. So we could go down to this example here, towards the end of the poem, there's no stop here. There's no stop from one stanza to the next. So as we go, I never wish to build again with brick or block, but let the daylight break through capitals and monoliths. So here, the enjambment is used by darker to mimic the way the light can break through. And that's where we would then need to make a connection to that extended metaphor of the light throughout the poem. So we have that on Jean, the, the and here, particularly from one stanza to another, the light can't be blocked or stopped. But equally, this is not a poem that just uses enjambment, clearly. 
Um, we have other examples as we move through. Um, in this stanza, I'll just change colour so you can see it. We have these caesura. And in this in these stanzas, that helps to develop a range of meanings where that flowing movement is halted and paused. So here we have our caesura. We have a halting, pausing moment. And the buildings themselves shifting and changing. These constructions made out of paper, the constructions of human history. The human history is unstable. And that could be reflected in the way the caesuras cause these pauses and halts and fragmentations. Equally, as we come to this stanza here, these stanzas, when we're talking about maps with their border lines and their boundaries, these caesuras help to break and fragment the poem in the same way as maps divide and codify geography and the natural world. And then what I wanted just to draw your attention to just at the end of the poem is one final further structural device. We've had in the poem so far quatrains and those are four line stanzas. They are organised regular and constrained. That despite the divine intervention of the light and the inspiration given by the light, that we still conform and follow patterns as human civilization. Our failings then are as inevitable as our successes. But we have this final stanza, a single line. This breaks the pattern of the poem. And perhaps is Darker's comment that we, as readers, can break the destructive cycles of human history. And that ultimately is how the poem completes. We have that transparency just beforehand, and we talked about that transparency allowing light in, allowing divine inspiration in, allowing us, to, allowing this opportunity for growth to enter into us before this single line breaking the pattern of quatrains that are built up through the poem. And it is that hopefulness at the end of the poem, this sense that humanity can grow and change and develop, can move away from the patterns and the destructive patterns of conflict, of abuses of power that have dominated human civilization and dominated human history. Um, and that brings to a conclusion this initial look at the poem tissue. I talked earlier at the start about poems being um, a room, an open room, a door way which we're invited into to look around where we define our own meanings and I invite you to do the same with this poem by tracing and tracking patterns through you may develop your own ind independent and individual ideas and I really do think that this is a poem that rewards this almost more than any other in the collection. I hope you found this video useful um, and I'll just remind you that for this poem in particular this is just one way of interpreting this poem amongst many others that you'll come across. Good luck in your explorations of this poem 
and I look forward to reading your responses and your essays and debating your ideas with you as you develop them.